Um, so this Wednesday is the beginning of Lent, and Lent may mean nothing to you, uh, but Lent actually has this deep religious spiritual meaning, which is season of spring. And the church co-opted it and said, hey, let's, let's use Lent as a time to get ourselves ready for Easter. So 40 days getting ready for Easter, reminding ourselves of the love of God that came in pursuit of us, reminding ourselves of what it cost God to deal with the problem of our sin and our world's sin, reminding ourselves of what it was that God did to go after death. I was sitting with, uh, I guess it was Phil, Phil Carmichael. We were just talking, we pray here about 8 o'clock, 8.30 on Sunday mornings, and we are talking about death because we're still feeling that uh, these days, and just talking about wouldn't it be amazing if there was a God who loved us enough to come after us and do something about death, you know? And Phil's like, I think somebody already did that, and that was the right answer, right? Wouldn't it be amazing if God had done stuff about the things that, just knock our world off kilter. So Lent is this 40 days of preparation, of reminder of the big day. And we got some things planned for Easter that looks like it could be some fun. I think we're going to do an outdoor Good Friday service. So if the weather's like this, bundle up, you know. And we're going to try to actually do some cool things Good Friday outside. And then our typical Sunday morning Easter sunrise service is also going to go off. Don't know what kind of food, if any, would be happening, but that's the deal. And then a 10 a.m. service to boot. So a couple of things. During Lent, what we wondered is you join us in praying. So on Mondays, we're going to invite you to be purposefully praying on Monday mornings from like 7.30 to 8. Just take some time to pray. Could you do that? Some of you, I know, do your best praying when you're um, in the car driving. So maybe that lines up or in the shower extra long shower, um, whatever it is, but Monday morning is going to pray. Wednesdays at noon, we're going to host a Zoom um, prayer gathering. So you can Zoom in, pray with us for half an hour from 12.00 to 1230. That's the plan Wednesdays. And then Thursdays in this whole season of Lent, which is about six weeks, we're going to ask you to walk a block. Um, Those of you who live on the farm, you got a big block. Um, but those of you who live rural or, or, I mean, urban, you can just scooch around. But we just thought it would be good for Christians to pray for up and down their streets or maybe up and down their hallways if you're in an apartment complex or condo or something like that. But to be prayerful around the people that God has planted you and you live with, all right, or live close to. So prayer initiative during Lent. Last year during Lent, a bunch of us decided that we would memorize Isaiah 53. And uh, that was fun. And I wonder if some of you would consider joining um, Brad Weber and I, at least, in memorizing the Beatitudes. So Matthew 5, 1 to 12. So it's a tough gig, memorizing. Uh, you have to shut the television off. You can't be watching your phone. It's really tough to do. You've got to focus. Um, but there's something happens for me. I'll tell you this. It's one of the most powerful spiritual disciplines for me is to memorize Scripture. It just gets inside my bloodstream, and it's good, good, good for me. Okay, those of you who are in the house, we have been ushering you in, which is a good thing. Um, We have been ushering you out, which we're no longer going to do. You're on your own. Um, It's like herding cats, right? So you don't have to be whatever, um, waiting for a tap on the shoulder. You can stay and be here, quiet, still talking. You can talk in the foyer if you want. Masks are still on. You can leave if you want to, however that all plays. I don't know. Um, Well, I shouldn't say anything. I'm I'm thinking it might be kind of nice if you could walk out that northern hall out to your car closer, but maybe you can't. Maybe you have to stay out here and go out these doors. But you can linger. The one concern that we have is if there's more than 40 of us in the foyer, um, some kind of COVID police will take us down. So, you know, if you're out there and it gets to about 35, 36, you might want to consider stepping back into the sanctuary or something like that. But we'd love to just have some chatter with you if you can. For now, that's what we were able to do. Okay, um, okay, dumb story, but that would be fun. So uh, I've been going up to Pefferlaw to skate. Skate has, they have an outdoor rink in Pefferlaw, and Isaac, who is on the keys, one of our sons, is back, and so he gives me credibility when I step on an ice sheet. And so we drove up to Pefferlaw to play on Friday, and we got all the way there, and I'm like, where's my skates? And uh, shoot, I forgot them back here. So like Isaac, you know, you got to take care of your geriatric father. So I left Isaac at the rink. I drove back to the house, get my skates, and I get back to the rink, and I sit down and start tying my skates up. And this little kid comes over to me and says, uh, we got to get a game going. And I'm, <laughs> I'm tying my skates. And this little, little kid, he's the littlest kid in the whole 
the whole game, the whole ice surface. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, for sure, I'm on that. He said, I've already talked to your son. I, and I'm like, oh, okay, all right. Uh, and he's like, let's get this thing going. I'm like, hey, buddy, what's your name? He's like, Beckett. Beckett John Samuel, I don't know, his name was Zinzendorf or something like that. And, I, and, I, and I'm like, hey, we have the same middle name. He goes, yeah, yeah, we got to get a game going. So I'm like, okay, I'm, on, I'm on it, dude. I'm going to work on this for you. Well, it turns out Isaac was talking to him. He said, I've already talked to your son. And so Isaac had spoken with him. And the kids skated up to him and said, hey, Isaac's the biggest kid out there. Um, this is why I go up at 4 o'clock, because just, there's just 12-year-olds up there, and my skill set works best with 12-year-olds. So Isaac's the biggest kid out there, and this kid had already skated up to Isaac and told him how it's going on. Isaac says to me this. He skated up, and he said, we've got to get a game going. And Isaac's like, well, I'm waiting for my dad. And, and uh, this, this kid says, well, where's your dad? He's like, well, he had to go get his skates. He forgot them. And he said, well, when is he going to get back? He said, I don't know, but he's driving a red car. So he's, this kid's waiting for me to come, sees my red car, <laughs> comes over to me. <laughs> anyway, the funniest thing is Isaac says to this kid, well, why don't you get a game going? He goes, me? I'm way too scared of strangers. <laughs> okay, Beckett, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Make me laugh. Okay, let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for a world that's filled with a precocious child like, like Beckett. We thank you for all the wonder in our world, for little fur, uh, feathered creatures that are outside our houses picking stuff off the grass or maybe out of a bird feeder. We thank you. I mean, we whine a little bit, but, you know, blowing snow, we look out there and we think, man, what a beautiful thing. We live in a fantastic world. We also live in a world where one country, big, big country, decides it's going to take over a little country and doesn't care about the hundreds or thousands that might die. And we stagger with that. We stagger with living in a world where there's such beauty and then such bullying where there's such grace and where there's such greed. And we stagger. And our book, your book, shows us why that is. You created a beautiful and good earth. You did it. And yet we've messed it up. And our own sin and our own selfishness, our own pushing ourselves to the front, gets in the way of good relationships and good community, real community. And so, living God, you came. You came into our world to show us, well, one, what life is supposed to be like, and then you took back, by your death on the cross, you took back the power that evil had assumed, that evil had been given by our disobedience. You took it back and you shattered the authorities and the powers. You kicked them in the teeth, as it were. You disarmed them, and now sin and death need no longer have any power in our lives, Jesus, because of what you did. And now you form in this new community. And we're, we're like toddlers. We're kind of barely learning how to walk. But you've called us into new life together, and we want to learn it. So that's why we're looking at your book. That's why we're studying. Teach us, Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Okay, we are in uh, Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read verse 33. You got it, Emma. Bang on. Sounds like this. Again, you've heard it said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the oaths you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white, or black, all you need to say is simply yes or no. And anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Okay, let me just back the bus up for a second in the reverse before we hit accelerator, go forward. We cannot earn a right relationship with Almighty God, right? When, when you're hearing these passages, I don't want you to hear that there's somehow a new law, a new set of rules, more impossible than the first set of rules, and if you do them, then you'll be right with God. It can't happen. Your salvation is a gift. God's already pleased because of what Jesus has done. Right? You're not trying to get God to be pleased with you. You're already loved. You're already his. And then Jesus brings us into a new community. So it's like this. It's like you're saved. That's an old church term, and it's a good term. It's like you're saved. You're saved from anger and, and lust and, 
and lying, right? And, and Jesus saves you from those things, and you're like, <sighs> on the shore, dripping wet. And that's not the end of the story, right? Jesus not only saves you from, but he saves you for. Right? He saves you so that you can tell the truth, so that you can love people, that you can show grace, right? You get that, right? So that so these things no longer ruin the earth, but that we begin to live, live this new life. Okay, so nobody should be hearing sermons that, that we're preaching from the Sermon on the Mount, like, oh my goodness, there's so much we've got to do before God's happy with us. Not at all. This is actually life. This is life you were set free for, life that you were saved for. Okay, one of the interesting things that you should hear again is that it takes time. It takes time to figure these things out. Right? So think about this for a second. I think it took about, well, someone could tell me better, but it took about a month or two to get Israel out of Egypt. Remember, there was all those plagues and stuff. It took a while, but maybe two months to get Israel out of Egypt. But then it took about 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel's head. They had learned to be a certain way as slaves, and they, it took a long time to unlearn all that stuff and to learn how to be the new community that God had for them to be. Two months to get Israel out of Egypt, 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel's head. Okay, so it just it takes time. That's the plan. All right, back to our passage. Kind of embarrassing. Emma, were you like grade seven or something like that? Emma, seven, no, six? When I was in grade seven, what was going on, and Emma, you'd be very interested in this. When I was, roller skating was all the rage. Okay, okay, a couple of heads are already bowed in embarrassment. Roller skating. And we would go to, on Sunday afternoons, we'd go to a roller skating rink, right? And it was like hardwood floor, and it was all sloped, and it was like, it was like super cool, and the lights were, and the Bay City Rollers were playing loud in our ears. It was quality stuff. Okay, there's some people that understand what I'm talking about. It's like a high school dance, but on wheels. And man, were we cool. The really cool guys could do it backwards. It's so embarrassing to remember all that. And in the songs, Ezekiel, they sounded like this, S-A-T-U-R-D-A-Y, night. This is back in the days when lyrics had deep significance. <laughs> people thought them through. All right. Anyway, it was for some reason, it was during Sunday afternoon roller skating episodes that it, it I became aware that I was underdeveloped. Yes, I was on the wrong side of the puberty train. I was this little guy, little skinny kid that, okay, this is just straight up, didn't have a cool backside like Scott Bayo did, Chachi, right? Or Eric Estrada. Like I was watching my television, I was looking at the mirror, and I was like, this is not working out. This is, I'm on the wrong side here. So I hatched a plan to appear to be the man I was not. And my plan was to wear three shirts and to tuck them in. Instant man buns, right? This is, this is, and I'm sure that everybody was fooled, right? Val, you're with me on this. You can see this, right? So, so that silly story is just to point out what's actually going on in this passage, right? They weren't padding their pants. What they were doing was they were trying to pad their words so they could sound more impressive more important than they really were. That's what's going on. I swear by all the tea in China. These are what they're saying, right? Cross my heart, I hope to die, right? I swear on the soul of my father and dig on my toil, you will reach the top alive, right? Like, but they weren't using those words. What they were saying was, by all the stars in heaven, that's what they were swearing. I swear by the earth, I swear by the holy city Jerusalem, or even on their own heads. Right? And, and they were specifically, the people of God were specifically forbidden from ever swearing using God's name. Some of you, some of you, one or two of you are reading Leviticus. You would have read either yesterday or today about a guy that swore using the Lord's name, stoned to death. So they had very clear commands. Never ever swear an oath and use the name of the living God to try to impress people because you might not keep your word or you actually don't have the power to invoke that. And that's very, very costly. What they were doing was they were trying to get as close to the name of God as they could. I swear by the heavens. I swear by the holy city, Jerusalem. And, and Jesus is like, what are you doing? You don't have control over those things. Why are you trying to be so important and so impressive, right? Heaven doesn't belong to you. It's God's throne. Earth, right? It's his footstool. Jerusalem is his city. It's like me swearing on the car of Phil Carmichael. Hey, 
I swear on the name of Phil Carmichael's car that the Maple Leafs are going to win the Stanley Cup. And like Phil's like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait. You, what, what's going on with my car? And who do you think you're going to give it to you if, if the Leafs don't win this thing? It's not your car. And why don't you swear on my car? Leave my car alone, right? And Jesus is saying the same thing. You don't even have power over your own head, right, to change one hair black or to change one hair white. You, you don't have any control over when that whole graying thing happens, right? You can't, like, fast forward that like you'd ever want to. Or definitely, you can't get this thing going in reverse, like, hmm, I think I'll go back to a full head of hair, right? The graying process, the balding process, is just a reminder of how little control we actually have. Hmm. Here's the question. Why are we trying to look bigger than we are? Why are we trying to sound more important than we really are? Isn't it because we want to be impressive? We want you to think that we're extra important? And it might actually be because we want to manipulate people. You see, if I sound really important, well, then maybe you'll be tempted to buy what I'm selling or to do what I want you to do or to buy into the very thing that I think you should be doing with your life, right? I want you to participate in something. And so if I talk big, then you'll feel pressure to join me, right? Maybe be a little more believable, sound more trustworthy than I am, right? Is it possible that sometimes we feel inadequate, we feel deficient, and so we try to use words to make ourselves look more important than we are? Say, Jesus is saying, I got a new community for you. You don't have to do that stuff anymore. No more swearing, heaven, earth, Jerusalem, your own head. Just say it straight. Yes or no. No one's impressed with all your big your words, with your big promises. We actually wind up looking smaller, not bigger, when we do that stuff. So here's a, here's a question. Question number one. Some of you, I see you're writing notes. It's a great question. Are you using words, whether you're overstating them or making big, big promises, to try to manipulate or impress people? That's a, that's a good question to answer. If you're in your small groups this week, I think that one comes your way. How am I, how are my words coming out of my mouth? Am I saying it bigger? So check that out. Um, yeah, you're not tucking five or three shirts into your pants, but sometimes we add words to, to be impressive. What's really interesting, and this is the second point, what's really interesting is that God has actually given you something that's way more significant than any overpromise that you could make. It's really cool. God has not given you sovereign power over the heavens that you might give away stars. God has not given you sovereign power all by yourself over earth, though human beings have a responsibility for earth. And you certainly can't in any way give away Jerusalem because you could visit there, but you, you get there, you realize it's not in your power to give away or to swear over. But God did leave you with this authority, and it's this, to say yes and or to say no. Now you're like, big deal. Oh, it's a big deal. Follow me here for a second. Jesus is building a new community. One of the fundamental the building blocks of that community is the autonomy of each human being and is the power that each human being has to say, yes, I can do that, or no, I will not do that. It's really powerful stuff. Yes or no. God left you sovereign over yourself, right? And, and you need to hear this, especially, Quinn, yeah, you got to hear this as a, as a young woman. You got to hear this stuff, right? He, God does not force you. You get to say yes. You get to say no about your life. So recently I was listening to psychologists talk, and they were talking in part about raising kids and the important things that have to happen in little kids' lives. And one of the important things that need to happen in little kids' lives, Ezekiel, is they got to get wrestled with. They need to be roughhoused with. Now, sometimes, like, this, this is when safe moms and dads do this. So we're not talking about wrong stuff, but good roughhousing, tumble, whatever, held upside down, those kinds of things, snuggled and hugged, right? This is what they need, healthy interaction. And it helps them learn their limits, what they can do, what they can't do. They figure out what hurts them, don't want to go that far again, and they learn what hurts other people. And, and they, they do this. And they're trying to keep the game going, right? Little kids do this. So they, they don't want to get injured, and they don't want to bop dad in the nose, and all of a sudden the whole game's over. So they learn their limits by just roughhousing and tumbling. And when it's healthy and good, this is an important piece of kids growing up. And one of the psychologists was saying that his observation, working with people, clinical therapists, 
one of his observations is that when kids don't get that kind of rough housing and sort of learn their body stuff, they, and when they get older, they kind of, they're a little bit socially awkward sometimes. They don't quite know where they are or where they aren't, what they're responsible for, what they aren't. And it makes sense. Because as you become adults, you realize that social interactions, particularly the complex ones, require this capacity in you to know where you are and then where you stop and the other person is, right? It's boundaries, boundaries. And when people don't have boundaries, uh, things get messed up, right? You, you learn what you're in charge of and what they're in charge of. This is like differentiation. It's an important piece of kids growing up. And, and when You've had that kind of experience with your body, then people have less ability to take advantage of you because you know, oh, that's me, that's mine, it's not yours to touch, this is me, and, and, and then you also know, oh, that's theirs, that's their problem, that's not mine. It's really important to learn, for kids to learn how to differentiate. Along with that is also a kid's capacity to learn the word yes and no. This is also part of them figuring out their their limits, who they are, who they're not. Yes and no. Kids need to hear those words coming out of their mouths, and those words need to be honored, actually. So, this is no news flash to anyone. Kids should always eat their peas before they get dessert. That's just wise, right? Veggies before sugar. That's just the way it should. It's true, Ezekiel, it's true. That's the way it's supposed to work, right? But, but a kid should also be able to say, no, no, I don't want to eat my peas. And then mom and dad just have to say, no problem, here's dessert, none of this until this is gone. Kids say, no, I'm not doing that thing. So never a good idea. This is true, right? To force feed peas, it's not a good thing. You, God doesn't force, we don't force. We say, fair enough. That's a choice that you get to make. They need opportunities to use the word yes, and they need opportunities to use the word no early on in their lives. You want to go for a hike? Nope. Leave it at that. No pressuring them. Come on, we're all going. You need to come. Why don't you want to spend time with us? You know, and shame, 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 and pressure, 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 right? No. Let their yes be yes. Let their no mean no. Let them feel the weight and the consequences of their words. That way, when they're big people, they know what each word means, and they can feel the force of it, and they know they'll be better to be able to stand up against peer pressure, and own the consequences of their own decisions and not be blaming other people, right? And they'll be able to know whether they're going to go along with the crowd or whether they're going to choose to go their own way, yes or no. It's important. And it's super important for Christians too, right? Just a crazy thing. Almighty God gives you the sovereignty, for now anyway, to say yes or no to him. And he doesn't force it. And he respects it. And the way I read my Bible, he respects it for eternity. Yes and no. So second question at the end of the second point is this. Do you have command of what God gave you command of? Do you say yes and no and mean it? Does your yes mean yes? Does your no mean no? Right? And maybe related to that, this might be a parent's thing, parents paying attention for a second. Right? Do you respect other people's yes? And other people's no. Okay, good questions. Okay, here's the third point, third piece. So what clearly Jesus is saying here, that in his new community of grace, people will do what they say. You get that? You don't have to impress people with your big words. You get to say yes and no. But then, and this is an important piece of this whole passage, is you say what you mean, and you mean what you say. Sounds like Dr. Seuss, doesn't it? Probably is. Uh, but it means, like, do you do what you say you're going to do? Some of you will have read Patrick Lencioni's book, uh, Five Dysfunctions of Team. And in that book, he explains that the, the primary way to break community down, the primary way to ruin a team is to breach trust. When people lose trust in each other, the team is in tatters. The community falls apart, right? That's, that's a problem. And the number one way that I know to break down trust is to not do what you said you were going to do. And that would be, along with its twin, to go ahead and do something you promised you would never, ever do again. If you want to break down trust, those are the ways to do it. They're trust killers. And Jesus knows this about us, and so he just says it straight up. In this community, we're not going to, well, 
You heard it from Lenita. We're not going to let anger run the show. We're not going to let lust ruin relationships between men and women. We are going to honor marriage and keep that as a highest sacred priority for those who are married. And then, and then this piece, we're going to keep our word. We're going to give our word, and we're going to keep our word. Just say yes or no. Let your yes mean yes. Let your no mean no. So here's, here's the question. How are you doing at keeping your word? Can you say yes? And when you do, do you do it? And can you say no? And when you do, can you leave it? Does your yes mean yes? Does your no mean no? And then Jesus throws this line in here. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Poof, playing for keeps here. When anyone, including Christians, break their word, they cooperate with the evil one. When anyone, including Christians, say yes but really mean no or say no and really mean yes, like they cooperate They're playing for the wrong team. That's what he's saying. When we try to borrow stature by using big words, by overstating our case, or by name dropping, or by citing studies that don't exist, you know, 67% of statistics are made up on the spot, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we do that stuff, we cooperate with the evil one. Don't, Don't overcook your words. Say it straight, yes or no. So if you say the check is in the mail, The check better be in the mail. If you say my dog ate my homework, then Rufus better have some loose leaf working through his digestive tract, you know? If you say, I've got a headache, you know what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, you better. So the evil one lied to Eve and Adam in the garden, and they believed him, and it brought such chaos into our world that we're still feeling it. The evil one loves lies. You just got to think about this for not too long to figure it out. The evil one loves lies because he knows what they do. They divide us, and they demean us, right? And they make us not trust each other. We get suspicious, and they ruin community. That's what lies do. People don't do what they say they're going to do. People do what they promise they would never, ever do again. Ruined community, mission accomplished. That's the evil one's agenda. I'm going to finish this way. Your father is not a liar, not ever once. Your heavenly Father does not lie. He can't. In fact, the Bible is full of promises, and so far, your Father is batting a 1,000. That's baseball speak for never misses even one pitch. Every time. Does what he says he's going to do. You see, God promised that one of Eve's offspring would redeem and fix the mess that they had made, and Jesus did it. God promised Abraham that one of his offspring was going to be a blessing to all of the nations, and Jesus did it. God promised that he himself would lead Israel out of Egypt, and it wasn't Jesus this time, not directly anyway, but Moses did it, and God kept his word. God promised to David that one of his descendants would always be on the throne forever king, and Jesus is that. God promised the Messiah who would be born in Bethlehem, who would do much of his ministry in the Galilee area, who would heal the sick, who would give sight to the blind, who would actually raise the dead, and Jesus did that. God promised that the Messiah would suffer, that he would take the sins of the world on himself, and that he would suffer quietly, and even though innocent would die, and Jesus did that. God promised that the Messiah would rise from the dead, and Jesus did it. Jesus actually said it would be like Jonah, who was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights, and Jesus was three days in the grave. Jesus promised an outpouring of his spirit onto his disciples, and he kept his word at Pentecost. Check again. And Jesus promised that anyone who repented of their sin, anyone who turned to God and asked for forgiveness would be forgiven. And he would, that person, she or he, would be given abundant and eternal life. And and they would abandon the old kingdom and they would turn and enter the new kingdom. And Jesus has been doing that for human beings to this day. And even for you, maybe, today, that's God's promise. Batting a thousand. Jesus also promised he would come back. And one day, set everything right. That's the one promise we're still waiting for. But this much we know, his yes means yes, and his no means no. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I've I've personally found it fascinating this time around in your word to sort of think about the things that you set as priorities. It went right after anger. Like, that was a 
That's a, that's a big deal. And then you went after lust, and then you went after marriage, and now you're going after oaths and words and the things that we say to each other. Powerful stuff. God, we're not going to try to pretend to be perfect community. We still fail. I, I dropped the ball. But we do know that you have redeemed us. You've called us by name, that because of the cross, because of the empty grave, we are saved. We have no more reason to fear the grave or to fear even our darkest temptations because you are walking us out of those things, and you certainly have covered the grave. When we die, we simply fall asleep to wake in your arms. It's a powerful promise that you've made for us. So God, here we are, this community of people who want to rise into this life that you've called us to, this new way of being as as women and men, as girls and as boys, together in this, cheering for each other, you know, encouraging each other, arm on each other's back, saying, you know, God's got us. Let's do this together. So we pray by your spirit, would you continue to grow this life in us? And would you allow us to be, no, not self-righteous in our communities, but simply a voice of encouragement and love, even for those who don't yet believe. Let it be, Lord Jesus, that your name is honored as your people study and make their way through this message that you preached. We pray it in your strong name, Lord. Amen. Okay, you are free to stand up if you want. I would like to speak a word of blessing over you. Got another song, yeah. two. You guys are good. Thanks for doing this. It's Love good it. stuff. Love it. Okay, and then, and then, like I said, you're free to linger, go, sprint to your car, chat with each other, however it works, okay? Good. Here, here's the heart of God for you. It's grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's love. The love of God the Father, and it's friendship the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day, tomorrow, forever. Amen.